I'll let's, so uh, went down and had a look at some stuff in the paddocks this morning and there were discussions about you know different pastures, some anti-methogenic pastures and some different um, mixes of species um, in pastures as well as you know annual forage crops and those kind of things. There was talk about um, greenhouse gas emissions and well, the anti-methogenic potential of these things. And there was also talk of production. So there was also talk of production, economics, those kind of things. Um, so what I'll hopefully be talking about and showing you some slides on <laughs> is really looking at these different things from a systems perspective. And it's kind of coming from that angle of, well, we're going through, <laughs> we're going through a period of, period of change. You know, there's different drivers for these changes. Um, you know, there's different options for what these changes might be and what they might mean and how do these actually fit within a system because we're not just talking about one pasture species or a mix it's about a system it's about how people do things and when you look at these when i'm talking about these things um <clears throat> hey when i'm talking about these things there's no one um you know single solution for what the future of a system is going to look like. You know, every single farm business has different risk appetite, different levels of working capital, scale, you know, labour constraints, and all these things have to get thrown into the mix. And then, you know, people kind of come up with those things that work for them. And so what I'm going to be trying to do is actually not necessarily talk about those things specifically, but give people enough information about what's going on, where we see the changes are going to happen, what the options are, so that people can start thinking about how these kind of things might fit in with their system. Now, rather than me stand up here and talk for however long I've been allocated, by all means, hit me with questions as I'm talking, but sometimes, you know, get a bit carried away. So George is going to just pull us into line if we need to kind of move on a bit, that kind of thing, but flexibility is good. Um, more than happy to answer questions as we go along if people, um, yeah, yeah, if people want to ask questions as we do it. Rightio, so we're talking about the future of pasture-based systems and where we're going. So why transform? Why do we actually need to think about these things? So clearly, you know, everybody is talking about this, these, about this now, you know, climate change. So greater climate variability, so not necessarily just, you know, warmer temperatures, but they've always said, or they've always projected, longer periods of wet, more intense wet, and then periods of dry, more intense dry. So that, you know, variability we had before would start doing that, you know, and we've just seen three of the wettest years kind of on record that followed some of the driest years on record. So those extremes will become more intense. And when you look at what's happened over time, that's, you know, what the bomber's seeing. Um, one of the key things about increased temperatures is that you have higher evapotranspiration. So in areas where, you know, if you go down south and you're in 600 mil rainfall zone and then you come up here and you're in 600 mil rainfall zone, you can't grow as much up here because you've got higher evapotranspiration. So that's going to push up evapotranspiration, which means that the, so the soil moisture levels in, you know, an average year will be lower. So we're probably going to be um, accessing less soil moisture. There's also the spread of pests and diseases. And um, so when, when I say diseases, animal diseases, plant diseases, those kind of things. As the, as the climates change, we're going to see things that we didn't see before. So I'm over on the coast on Taree, on Taree, near Taree, um, buffalo fly, you know. It wasn't there 10 years ago. Now we're hitting them a couple of times a year just to control the buffalo fly. And they're predicting that that's going to keep coming down the coast. So one graph, this is um, a climate projection. So <coughs> this is what they're predicting predicting are there going to be the number of days, additional number of days above 35 degrees at 2060. So whatever there currently is, we're not talking about that. But around Tamworth, or just to the west of Tamworth, they're talking an extra 10 to 20 days above 35 degrees per year, nearly up to a month once you get out around Canamble and you get further west and you're talking about over a month of an increase in the number of days over that. If you look at that for rain, you're going to see, you'd see changes in rainfall intensity projections and stuff like that. So the rain will all come at once, which then you get more runoff, you don't have as much infiltration, all these kind of things will interact. So we're going to be faced with a number of things, a number of different challenges as the climate changes, and we need to somehow adapt to those kind of things. 
The other one is the markets. So even if somebody's sitting here going, well, climate change is bullshit, um, and, you know, I'm going to do X or Y or whatever, the markets are driving this change. Have no doubt that the markets are coming in. A lot of it's driven by consumer demand. A lot of it is they want to show that they're doing the right thing. They're acting on climate change and the market is changing. So you, you might, I put it down to the con, that consumer demand is driving that supply chain thing and I, I think that's right. There's nothing to actually say that's for certain but it's happening in the way of industry targets. So MLA has their CN30 target, carbon neutral by 2030. That's for, for across the, the red meat industry. The grains industry hasn't got anything yet. They're working on that. They'll come up with something, but they don't have some of the really good um, technologies that the red meat industry has to access. But there's also international policies. So even if we in Australia go, oh, look, I don't give a shit, then the EU puts in there, I've shortened it here to CBAM, which is carbon, carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. And they say, well, you Aussie farmers aren't doing enough, so therefore we're going to tax anything that you import. We don't want to have whatever we take into the EU taxed because they think that we're not doing the right thing. So we need to make sure that we're meeting that because there's a real, real chance that we could lose market access once somebody in another country says, OK, this is, this is how we see it, so if you're not going to play ball, we do it. So what happens internationally is going to drive what needs to happen in Australia. Um, there was something else that I was going to say about that. It'll come to me. Um, so the changes are happening. Ah, oh, that's what it was. So one big feedlot company has, and I'll go into these technologies later on, has said, there's this technology, it reduces enteric methane. There's a limited global supply of that at the moment because they can't, they've got to scale it up. And that feedlot company, nobody has to guess what it is, said, you know what, we want it all. Everything you've got, we want it and we're going to start using it. Okay, so what my guess is, not just my guess, guess of the people that I work with is that <clears throat> when it comes to the crunch, they're going to be buying in steers or heifers to put through their feedlots and they're going to say, what is your carbon footprint? What's the carbon footprint of this that I'm buying? And they're not going to say, okay, well, look, you've got low carbon footprint beef because of whatever you're doing. They're just going to say, you're too high, we're not buying it. We don't want your high carbon footprint beef going into our low carbon footprint supply chain because that blows it all out of the water. That is what we predicted. There's not going to be any premiums around this. We don't think it'll be premiums. We think it'll just be you don't have access to those markets that you used to have access to. That is a pretty bold prediction. I'll probably you know, stand up here in two years and go, well, that was wrong. Um, but <laughs> that, is, that is the gut feeling of like the research teams that I work in and all the rest of it. That's the gut feeling of how this, this works. And you know, some of the industry players that we talk to and stuff like that. OK, so greenhouse gas emissions in grazing systems. Oh. Right, so the key greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, N2O, and methane, CH4. So carbon dioxide comes from things like when residues break down, all the rest of it. When soil carbon is emitted back to the atmosphere, you've got a CO2 emission. Nitrous oxide generally associated with the breakdown of residues and plant residues, also the use of nitrogenous fertilisers, so urea and stuff like that. Pardon me. And then you've also got methane, so enteric methane. So, you know, cattle belching, you're thinking it's the batteries? Yep, rightio. Um, so they're the key greenhouse gas emissions that are accounted for when we're doing all this kind of stuff. There's another, I don't know, 100 or something, but we don't actually um, worry about that because they make up such a small proportion of the gases. When we're doing this stuff, we talk about a 100-year global warming potential. So essentially what that says is that you know, carbon dioxide has a value of one. Um, nitrous oxide has 275 times the impact of carbon dioxide over um, a 100-year period compared to carbon dioxide. And then methane has 25 or 27, depending on what it's from. Because, uh, because enteric methane, for example, is biologically produced, it gets 25. If it's methane that comes out of the ground, it gets 27. 
I won't go into the mechanism of that. It's all about cycling, uh, nutrient cycling and carbon cycling in the atmosphere and everything else. And so that puts everything on an even keel so that you can assess things. So when you look at a carbon footprint, you're talking about it on a, on a CO2 equivalent basis. And you use those factors there to adjust your emissions so that you're talking about everything on an, on an even, even keel. And I just mentioned that. Um, and importantly, I just mentioned it before, but I'll mention it again. So there's a lot of talk about um, soil carbon and you're going to sequester all this soil carbon, you're going to reduce your emissions and everything else. Yeah, you can do that, 100%. It can also be an emission source. Once you get soil carbon into your ground, it doesn't mean it's there forever. It can escape. So a really good example of this was research that we did at Condo um, ag, ag Station took paddocks, they'd had the snot flogged out of them in a cropping system and converted them to conservation farming. So zero till, rotate your crops, um, you know, 100% stubble retention, all the rest of it. And I, I, I can't remember the years, that was the mid 90s I think, I don't know, some people may have even gone and seen those trials. And so what happened, what, what you would predict would happen in those circumstances is that you would see an increase in your soil carbon, you'd see soil carbon sequestration. One of, the main, one of the good ways to burn your carbon is to plough your, plow your paddocks. So you stop ploughing your paddocks, you, you, you're looking at nutrition better and, and you're retaining your stubble, you know, you're going to increase your soil carbon. And that's what happened. We, we went every three years, sampled it, we had these really, really, really nice increases. 2012, oh, the years are all out of way, it must have been 2010, had this really good increase. We went back in 2013 and some treatments were not only back to where they started, some treatments were lower than where they started. So if anybody out there tells you that you're going to sequester soil carbon by doing X, you know, doing handstands through the paddock, whatever, and don't worry about it, they're talking shit, okay? You really, really, really need to be aware that soil carbon cycles through the soil just like anything else. And that's a half an hour presentation, so I don't really want to go any further on that. So if we look at where the greenhouse gas emissions are emitted in a beef system, in a beef enterprise, I need to give you the background to this. This is a low input extensive beef production system. Um, uh, kind of northern New South Wales, just roaming around doing their thing, okay? Enteric methane makes up 85% of the total greenhouse gas emissions that come out of that. This is, and this is on CO2 equivalent basis. 85% of the total greenhouse gas emissions come from enteric methane. 6% of emissions come from manure. So when manure goes onto the ground, it puts nitrogen onto the soil. Some of that nitrogen is emitted as nitrous oxide, very potent. And some of it, you know, there's various ways that it actually you get um, methane uh, emissions out of manure. Um, why does it have, okay, I've just confused myself here because we've got urine and dung separately, so that must be methane manure because it was in a warmer. So that's going to be methane. This here would be the nitrous oxide. There's a trading component to the enterprise that this was done on. So you've got the emissions associated with the livestock that you've bought into your system. What isn't showing up here is direct and indirect nitrous oxide emissions. So there was talk of urea down there before. Um, in these systems where you've got tropical pastures and you need that end to drive the system, and this, uh, I can't remember who said it actually, you know, it was like, well, if we put on 200 units, Sean's waving, if we, if we put on 200 units of nitrogen, then we get all this ad additional production and our quality stays good and everything else, which you'll find out there's a benefit to having that quality, but you're just pumping out nitrous oxide and that goes onto your carbon footprint. So it's not about, when you're thinking about all these things, it's not about, well, what do I do to reduce my emissions? It's, or what do I do, you know, if I do this, I'm gonna have my maximum amount of emissions. It's about how do I optimize my emissions for what I do? How do I make the decisions so that my production and my emissions are optimized and it's an economically viable for me to do those kind of things. So you've got to take those three things into consideration. Um, so I don't think there was anything else I wanted to say to that one. So you just need to be aware. And also that was the other thing We've got here pre-farm emissions. So when you're looking at the carbon footprint, depending on how they do it, um, you know, you emit quite a bit of nitrous oxide when you use, say, urea. And it doesn't matter what, sorry, I'll just 
also say, it doesn't matter what form of nitrogen you put on your paddocks. It doesn't matter if it's ammonium nitrate, it doesn't matter if it's urea, it doesn't matter if it's chicken shit. It does not matter. You put nitrogen on there, you're emitting nitrous oxide. So if you put on 100 units of N as urea and 100 units of N as chicken manure, the amount of nitrous oxide that you're emitting is pretty much the same. They've got slightly emission, different emissions factors, but you're emitting the same amount of greenhouse gases. There's no free lunch in any of this stuff. So that's the emissions profile. Now, I'm going to focus on enteric methane here because we need to talk about what influences emissions in a en beef enterprise specifically, but this will also be for, for sheep. Um, and what we need to think about is what affects that methane because that's where a lot of the gains are going to be. So intake quality, what the animals are eating, that is the, one of the key drivers of methane and Sue said that. So if you've got high quality pastures that move through the rumen quickly and they ruminate efficiently, you have low methane associated with that. So if you put um, animals on lucerne and they're doing good live weight gains on a daily basis, then you've got low emissions associated with that live weight gain. Go and put them out in the back paddock where you've got this tall rank stuff, you're going to be belching so much methane for every kilogram of live weight, it's not funny. Plus they're not going to put the weight on anyway compared to the lucerne. So that intake quality is key. Your dry matter digestibility, your metabolizable energy, those kind of things, the higher the better. That is how you get efficient rumination and efficient red meat production. Animal numbers. <laughs> the more animals you've got, the more emissions you've got. So this comes in, I, I, I won't jump forward, but you might want to destock and say, oh, I'm going to have fewer animals. Mm, okay, radio. Or, you know, you might think oh, I can run the existing number of animals more efficiently. What's going to be the most economically viable opportunity for you here? Are you better off trying to reduce the number of animals to reduce your overall emissions? I don't know. It'll work on a case-by-case -case basis. So fertiliser use, I've already mentioned that. Residue emissions. As there's nitrogen in every single plant that's grown because they take it up out of the soil, that decomposes back into the soil and when it does, it emits greenhouse gases and they're taken into account. So when we calculate all these kind of things, we estimate what the residues were and then we calculate the emissions that were emitted from those residues. Fuel use, very small component, but particularly in, you know, if you've got a mixed farming type setup, you know, moving to something, if electric, electric tractors come online or hydrogen tractors, there could be savings there. Um, and soil carbon changes. So changes, not increases, not decreases, soil carbon changes. So the key thing, though, is that particularly things like intake quality, animal numbers, residue emissions, seasonal conditions. All, the, all of these things interact together and all those things are driven by seasonal conditions. Gets dry, your animal numbers are going to go up. Gets wet, your animal down. <laughs> yeah, let's all, let's all increase our numbers in drought. Um, we'll go down. Wet times will go up, you know. Pasture quality or your intake quality is probably going to go down in a drought because you're not getting that green pick coming up. When you've got really good abundant pasture like we saw down there before, then, you know, you're, you're going to have uh, far better intake quality. You've got supplements. You can supplement your animals. You know, a really good way to reduce the, emission, the methane, enteric methane emissions of animals is to put some grain into a lick feeder in the sheep paddock and let them go and eat that ad lib, you know. But then you've got to take into account the emissions associated with producing that grain. So that, that then adds on to your footprint. You can't just go and get all this stuff from somewhere else, put it into your system and then say, hey, look how, look how you know, my methane emissions are nothing. Otherwise, we'd say that, you know, feedlot beef has got no emissions. But, you know, it's very emissions efficient. So it's relatively low emissions intensity because their intake quality is so high. Um, so we need to take into account the seasonal conditions, influence all these things, that they, all these things interact. It becomes a bit of a morass, you know? And then you start thinking, well, how do I actually manage these things for seasonal conditions and greenhouse gas? Um, for seasonal conditions and thinking about my carbon footprint. One of the other things that really throw a bit of a curveball is the whole thing about emissions intensity. And I've put beef here, okay? But I'm going to use an example from lamb. 
Right, so emissions intensity. How many kilograms of CO2 equivalent did it take to produce this kilogram of lamb that's sitting there at the butchers? Versus what are the total emissions of my farm of 1,000 hectares? Now, the reason that this is important is that depending on what you're trying to achieve uh, will result in a different strategy. So if a feedlot says to you, I want low emissions intensity beef, the strategies you might take might be different to you saying, I've reduced, I'm a carbon neutral farm because I've reduced my overall emissions. And there's the really good example that I've done um, with a, a pasture researcher recently was we looked at Vicerula, which was down there, I think, if not, it's out there. So it's got these secondary metabolites which, which reduce your um, enteric methane production. And <clears throat> We said, okay, so you get 40% emissions reduction or enteric methane emissions reduction when you feed an animal by cerula. We compared that with subclover. So your subclover is your baseline or your reference system. We said, what happens if you use by cerula, move to by cerula? What happens if you move to leucine? Now, by cerula doesn't produce as much biomass as leucine. The feed quality isn't as great. And there's also some negative effects on, um, I think the sheep just feel crook. And so their intake drops. So their weight gain is nowhere near as high. So what we found was that if we wanted to grow low emissions intensity lamb, the best way to do that was to so loosen. Because you've got really high quality, you've got a lot of biomass, good intake, you're growing the lambs fast and you're getting them off the paddock sooner. Low emissions intensity lamb. That's great. But because you can double your stocking rate with loosen compared to bison ruler, your total emissions go through the roof. So how you look at this and what you're trying to achieve will depend on what you want to do. You could say the loosen and just run it at the same stocking rate that you would have run the bison ruler. That doesn't make economic sense. Who's going to you know what I mean? So there's all these bits and pieces that need to be thought about. And this will start coming out a bit more. I mean, there'll be policies that'll be implemented around this. Supply chains will make their targets clear so you know what you need to do and, what, and all the rest of it. But there's a definite tension between that low emissions intensity stuff versus your total emissions. Something else that, where am I up to? That's half an hour. How long have I got, George? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into that then because I've probably spent 15 minutes rambling on about that. Um, so we just need to be aware that there's going to be different, that you might be trying to meet different targets and the way that you do meet those different targets will be different. How do we estimate emissions? At the moment, um, there's these greenhouse, greenhouse, <laughs> greenhouse accounting framework tools that the University of Melbourne have set up, which are a spreadsheet. Anybody can download it, anybody can go in, fill out their spreadsheet. It's a lot bigger than this, but this gives you an idea of the kind of data that you need. Okay, so you need quarterly live weights for your animals in your different classes. You need to know what your live weight gains were and you need the number of livestock. These things here are populated automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. You go through your electricity consumption, your, your fuel use, you put all that data into it and then, and bing, gives you a magic number. It tells you what your emissions intensity is as well as what your total emissions for your enterprise are. So if you're competent with Excel, um, then this is something that already exists and you can access now and have a good crack at it. Um, there are other things that will hopefully come online. So one thing that I am trying to get funding now for is what we're calling the emission, Emissions Monitoring and Evaluation Framework. And essentially what that does is it goes in behind your farm management system, sucks the data out, throws it over in the cloud, does all the calculations for you and then emails you back a report to say this is what it is. That is already being set up for cropping enterprises under the Cool Soil Initiative down in Victoria, where they're doing that with cropping and with um, purely cropping enterprises. Um, DPI wants to set something like that up for grazing systems because people need to know this stuff. Um, 
and there was something else that will come online. But there will be tools that are bought. There are other tools out there. Like there's a whole, I wrote a whole report on the different tools that you can use. And the GAF tool is just easy to use and it's consistent with Australia, what, what we need to do in Australia. So um, my email address will be somewhere. If anybody wants the links to those, email me and I'll just email, email back the link so that people can go and download them. Don't necessarily go and search for them, just, yeah. Or ask George for my email address, happy to, happy to provide that. Um, okay, so we've got the emissions. We've got an idea of where they come from. Seasonal conditions, how all these things actually mix together. What are, what are our opportunities? This, this isn't just now, there are some that are now, but this is also talking about what's going to be coming out in the future. Clear distinction between avoided emissions and sequestration. Avoided emissions means, you know, if you were going to go from um, a diesel tractor to a hydrogen tractor where you produce the hydrogen using green energy, you used to emit emissions associated with diesel combustion. I no longer do. That's an avoided emission. Once you get that credit or once you have that reduction, they can't put that back onto your account. They come back, can't come back in three years' time and say, oh, you know what? you know, we're going to put this back on and you're no longer carbon neutral or you've no longer met your, your target or whatever. Sequestration, on the other hand, you know, as I banged on about with soil sequestration, it can come back and bite you in the ass. Planting trees, you know, you can plant trees, you sequester all this carbon, the fire goes through it. So avoided emissions are a far more secure way of reducing your emissions than sequestration. There's risk around, sorry, uh, avoided emissions are a far less riskier way of getting your total emissions down than sequestration. Anti-methogenic pastures. We went through some of those already. We've, we've spoken about them. I've spoken about them a bit more. Was there anything else I wanted to say about anti-methogenic pastures? I guess when you, th when you think about anti-methogenic pastures, what we need is something, and this is, you know, because we're doing some of this work, is we want to find things that are a good fit for the existing systems. So you don't, naturally, you don't actually need to go out and make big changes. You find something that is comparable. You know, if they bred uh, a lucerne, which hopefully they will, a lucerne that's got high tannin rates in it, fantastic. What do you have to do to reduce your emissions? Absolutely nothing. You just buy a different seed that, you know, there's going to be PBR on it kind of thing, and you keep doing what you've always done. They're the kind of things that we need as solutions. Um, buy Cerula, if you're in WA, where's Pete? Yeah, if you're in, you know, so they, they've been using it. Is it a good fit for our systems here? It might be a good fit down south where you've got sandier soils and stuff. You know, looking at those clays out there, yeah, maybe not. Um, three Nop and Asparagopsis. Sue's mentioned Asparagopsis. Three Nop is essentially the same thing as Asparagopsis. It um, reduces the methane production when animals ruminate. Now, 3-NOP is the thing that I was talking about, that that feedlot has said there's a limited supply, I want all of it, okay? Asparagopsis, you look at that and you just think, are we going to dig up half of Australia to produce ponds where we can produce that asparagopsis? You know, looking at the timeline and the cost of getting enough asparagopsis for the Australian herd is just massive. 3-NOP is a produced in a factory and they're, they're starting to scale that up now. Where three knop is at the moment, if you could buy some and you're doing a feedlot, it's really effective, but it breaks down in the rumen really quickly. So it's great in a feedlot because they get up, they walk over to the bunker, they fill themselves, go back, do it again. And there's always three knop in that. When you start moving to extensive systems where you're not actually supplementing them or an intensive pasture-based system where you're supplementing them, it still isn't good enough because it breaks down too quickly, but they do have a slow release version and they are producing a slower release version. So when you have feeders in the paddock, three knot will be something that will become available and, and the animals are doing it ad lib. Um, extensive base systems, okay, excellent. You've got a really slow release thing where they only need to have it once a day. Well, still, how do you get into it? If you're at Hilston, you know, how the hell do you get them to something once a day? Are you moving a feeder around? Is there gonna be a lick block, that kind of thing? So three knot is an existing technology there isn't any of it, but that will come, in, come online relatively quickly. At the moment, it's cost prohibitive. I wish I could remember the number, but that as they ramp up production, it will cost less. But 
you know, if you need to put money in to maintain your supply chain, maybe in the end it'll be cost neutral, you know. Who knows? We'll, we'll see how these kind of things play out. Culling unproductive cattle, massive one. You've got, you know, you, you go through your joining period, you preg test them, you've got this beautiful girl that you love and all the rest of it, she's just going to wander around, but she didn't join, she's going to wander around the paddock, bel belching out methane, putting your total emissions through the roof, send her off, get rid of her. Keep your replacements and start doing that. You know, that's meant to be the best thing for productivity anyway, but it also reduces your total greenhouse gas emissions because you haven't got animals walking around doing nothing. Getting animals to sale weight sooner. This flows back into your pasture quality and, or your intake quality, rather. So if you hang on to an animal and, I don't know, you wanna, you're doing a trading enterprise and you want to, um, and you want to get it from X to Y and you do it in 160 days instead of 200 days, that's 40 days less methane that's been, worth of methane that's been emitted to the atmosphere. So by improving your, the quality of the intake, you put on more live weight, get them through sooner, that reduces your total emissions. What you need to then think about is that when Sean maybe was talking about, well, let's throw 200 units of urea on, okay, that's gonna increase the quality of my pasture, I'm gonna put on live weight gain for longer, I'm gonna get my animals through sooner, but what are the emissions for the nitrous oxide from using that fertiliser compared to not using it? And how do all these things interact? So we're getting a benefit, we're reducing our enteric methane emissions, but then we've got to add on the emissions that come with that fertiliser use. And so you're weighing up those different things. So the, the best thing might be to mix pasture. So if you have loosen and digit and you're going through and so you're maintaining your quality as best you can without those inputs, that may be the best way. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you what the answer is but it's just doing what you can to maintain that quality for as long as possible. And you can sequester soil carbon. You can put in revegetation. I'm not going to go there again, you know, potentially high risk. Um, they are, oh yeah, and revegetation. So at the moment when you're looking at um, reducing your emissions now, they're kind of what is available at the moment and what's coming online. There'll be other things that'll come online, but I don't think that they're going to actually um, step away from this drastically. I think there's still, there's only certain pathways that you can take to do this stuff. Um, but focusing on um, intake quality, growth rates, those kind of things is a really good thing, is an exceptional thing. And understanding those things, understanding quality and, and the role of quality and all the rest of it. So a really good story that I heard from OptiWay, the guys that put those things where you can, the cattle walk up, they get a bit ways, reads the ear tag ways and you're getting the weights on a, on a daily basis kind of thing. They get people ringing up and saying, hey, yes, I just bought this from you and it's broken. And they're like, what's the matter? And they say, oh, I've got so much feed, it's not funny and I'm getting 100 grams a day. I should be getting 1.3 kilos. And he goes, oh, well, something's wrong, goes out there, and they've got ranked feed like that that's got no quality in it. Of course, they're putting on 0.1 kilos a day. Put that opti way into a loosened paddock, and it will tell you, yeah. So that role of quality is, and maintaining that quality will be one of the things. It's something that we're actually focusing on in DPI. Um, so demonstrating emissions reductions. Carbon credits. We've all heard about carbon credits go and get accus and get soil carbon and all the rest of them participate in these things so that you can get carbon credits and then sell them and make all this money. Well, I can't remember the order that I've put this in. Do you sell them or do you keep them? Because you can't do both, okay? You can't double count. So you can't say, oh, I've sequestered this soil carbon, I'm selling them for hundred bucks a tonne and everything that you get yourself for hundred bucks a tonne, your emissions are where they always were. You cannot double count and do that twice. So the general, knowing what's happening and knowing that there's going to be a demand for lower emission stuff, the general consensus that's moving more and more to, well, sorry, it was over there, now it's moving more and more towards a general consensus, is farmers keep their credits. What's worth more to you? A tonne of carbon at 35 bucks? Or maintaining your market access because you've got an emissions reduction? It'll vary. It'll vary for different enterprises. It'll vary for what people want to do and all the rest of it. So that needs to be given really, really, really careful consideration. Um, Am I hearing you wrong when you say in two years' time, soil carbon's gone out the bloody soil and into the atmosphere, so you haven't got any carbon credits to sell? <laughs> well, which is it? 
No, you've got no carbon credits to sell. You're going out onto the open market buying them to replace them. But I don't want to get into that because I'm running out of time. Sorry, I can talk to you about that a bit later. Um, and going, that's, I remember going back to that, do I need carbon credits? You probably won't because if you're going through a process of demonstrating what your footprint is, they're not going to ask for credits or anything like that. They're just going to say, what's your carbon footprint? How much have you reduced it by over the last two years, five years, ten years? I want to see that you're on a steady decline and that kind of thing. So you probably won't even need to generate credits, go through all the rigmarole and crap of actually generating these credits. They're probably not even going to be needed. Um, dealing with climate variability. Drought strategies. Um, you know, having a drought strategy in place so when it does turn dry, what do you do? Everybody's going to have one and after every single drought they're going to change it because there was something that they could, could have tweaked better. You know, nothing's ever going to be perfect. But having a drought strategy in place is, you know, pretty fundamental. Have a flood wet strategy in place. I got caught out. It was that wet we couldn't cut silage on the coast, couldn't cut silage last summer, couldn't even get tractors on the paddock to cut silage, so we had sweet FA silage and it was too wet so we couldn't get a, you put ryegrass and clover, sow that into your summer pastures, couldn't get on there to do that. I destocked because it was too freaking wet, you know, just madness. So I now need to change, you know, the way that I think about these kind of things because, I don't know, I've only lived on the coast for three years and I'm still a bit staggered. Um, can you trade more stock? Does that give you the flexibility, you know, reduce your breeding herd, people would do this anyway, and you trade stock to meet those seasonal conditions. When it's dry, you've got no stock that you're trading, you're holding on to your breeding herd. When the conditions are better, then you trade, you know, but then you're toying with markets and, you know, not always good. Can you change your livestock type or your livestock breed? You know, so I've started infusing Senapole, tropically adapted um, Bostaurus into Angus because I want pink eye resistance, I want tick resistance, those kind of things. So starting to get some of those traits into a traditional British breed. Uh, you know, the, at what point do people maybe start thinking about floppy ears? You know, those kind of things. What's the markets for those? Thinking about how these things can actually you can use these things to adapt to what they're predicting in the future. You know, like if you've got, trop well, if you've got Bos Indicus, they're more efficient on, you know, on, on poor quality feed. They don't need as high quality feed, things like that. You can change the pasture type. That's what they were talking about down there. This isn't probably, you know, there's a lot of tropical pastures around here. This is probably more relevant to maybe the tablelands or when you're starting to move further south. You know, are tropical pastures suddenly, well not suddenly, are they going to start appearing more and more up around Armadale and places like that? Because as the, sh the shift in rainfall patterns occurs, maybe they're going to be more persistent, you know, things like that. But you've got all these different things that come into this from a management perspective. What's the persistence of these things? You have to manage, you know, so if you put, if you've got a mix of Bicerula and Lucin, um, and you put the sheep in there and it's a relatively low stocking rate, you're not going to have any loosen anymore because they're not going to touch the bicer ruler. It makes them feel crook in the guts. They're just going to flog the loosen to death until there's nothing there and you've got a paddock of bicer ruler. So does that mean you need to increase your stocking intensity? You know, do you have to do somehow smaller paddocks or electric fences or something so that you're grazing it more uniformly so that you're getting that persistence, so that the investment that you're putting into these things actually, you know, goes out past a year or two, things like that. So understanding how that fits in with people's time constraints and management style and, you know, available capital, that kind of thing. Um, the final thing is uh, carbon neutral research stations. So DPI has a program now where we're going to move eventually all of our research stations so that they're carbon neutral. So we get them all down to zero. And the idea behind that is that these things that I'm talking about, we start implementing those on research stations, we look at alternative energy sources, we look at, you know, so we're looking at the dairy down at Tokau, we're looking at absolutely everything. And the idea is that um, we go through, we baseline our emissions, this is what it is, these are what our projections are, and then we try and meet what those projections are based on those technologies. People can come in, there'll be field days, people can come in, what's this? That's an electric ute, how's it gone? <laughs> Yeah, it's great. You know, this is, the, this is how it's worked. This is what the limitations are. Kick tyres. Hopefully, after chat today, we're going to see um, those, some of those pasture mixes 
or some of those pasture species that we looked at this morning planted into a bigger paddock and just run under normal management to see how long they actually persist. You know, things like that. So people can walk around and actually say, oh, well, look at this. How does this work? What's this? How have you done this? How have you done that? So, and then reporting the economics behind it. So it's not just about, oh, this is what it is. This is what it costs us. These are the downsides, completely and utterly transparent, and these are the emissions reductions that we've had. And with the initial thing being four stations getting to carbon neutral by 2030. So that's the target initially. Um, and that's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So, okay, so I guess you take a carbon molecule and, it, and you get that and you do something with it and you emit it as carbon monoxide. It has no impact. But you feed that to cattle, the cattle do something with it and it's emitted as carbon dioxide when they respire, that's having an impact. Methane, that's having an impact. So it's converting that simple carbon molecule in that cycle into something that's having no impact or having a benefit to something that is having an impact. One of the, and cycle is probably the key thing. I hope I'm answering your question. Um, cycling is one of the key things. So you've got grass that you've grown, it's sequestered carbon. We know that 99.9% .9 of that is going to be re-emitted. So we could, what you're saying is completely and utterly correct in that we could do a daily carbon balance on your property. We're actually looking at doing some of this stuff down around Canoundra to look at how much is sequestered or emitted on a daily basis out of the soil and the pasture. And we know that when the pasture decomposes, there'll be more carbon dioxide, things like that. We could do that on a daily basis and do a daily carbon balance. And at the end, see what happened over a year. But I would really not be interested in trying to attempt that because it would just be horrendous to do. So doing it on an annual basis, or in that case, a seasonal basis, I would say we do take that into account. Or, sorry, not, not me. The frameworks that have been set up do take that into account, but it's recognising that this stuff is cycling through because none of that carbon is effectively permanent that goes into the system. It's just being transformed into something that is having an impact. Yep. So with methane, there is... OK, so carbon dioxide emissions, um, we need to bring them below zero and we need to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Methane emissions, we don't need to get down to zero. We know that we can reach targets by reducing it. I, don't, I can't remember what it is. We know we can reduce it by 50% or 70% or something to, get, to meet our, our, our temperature targets. One of the other things that's not considered is that when you have a, a, a methane pulse into the atmosphere, it's not just the impacts of that methane on the atmosphere then. That starts a whole heap of feedback cycles. So you might say, well, you know, I've got this pulse emission of methane. So by pulse emission, the cattle have belched out over a day. That's going to magnify over time because you're having these feedback cycles which then flow into all these other... Into the, into the entire global thing. So you've got to take those into account. But in the end, the main thing is, is that if we had the same cattle herd and we kept emitting that methane, we wouldn't make a, we wouldn't make a change. But if we reduce our methane, then we will be able to get closer to our target. So there's a lot, you know, I, I watch those videos and so I think I understand where you're coming from um, with that. Um, and it does make sense. Look, it's... I've spent way too much time thinking about it. Hopefully, I've given you a, a good enough answer. Okay, it's complicated, but I can give you an answer to this, but I'm going to go back to dairy because I've actually looked at this in dairy systems. So for asparagopsis, um, if you fed dairy cattle on the north coast of New South Wales asparagopsis, the, and I can't give you the percentages, I'll, I'll try and give you percentages, but I'm half talking out my butt. If you, um, if you feed them asparagopsis, milk production will drop by about 10% per head. Enteric methane will drop, you know, 60%, 70%. But the critical thing is, is that your feed conversion ratio plummets. So when you put that through your average or your representative north coast dairy farm, it means you can produce about 60% more milk using the same amount of feed at that same quality. You need more cattle to do it, so then your constraints are, how do you milk them, have you got enough shade, what's your laneway system like, you start getting into all those kind of things. So the end result is, is that it's complicated, but 
there have been, it has been demonstrated that there are benefits to production by doing this. How those benefits actually unfold uh, is, yeah, is complex. And I think, you know, once there's more research done on it, then we'll be able to answer that far better. But hopefully that dairy example gives you a bit of, yeah, a bit of an understanding, you know, just about the complexities of it. Because it's not just about weight gain. You know, you're bringing all these other things to it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs>